Liz Shazen and Debra Yonick. Uh, Liz is the CMO of the MBI and president of Pura Marketing Council. She has a long history of successful marketing and research projects, as well as trade association development, specializing in the jewelry industry worldwide. Major projects that have included where she introduced the Champagne Diamonds to the American consumer and operated the Champagne Diamond Registry, sponsored by Rio Tinto for 22 years, where she created and developed and managed the indo Argyle Diamond Council, She's, which launched in Canada and many others, and many other achievements. Debra Yonick has been writing about jewelry and the business of selling it for about 30 years. She began her career in the industry as editor-in-chief of Colored Stone Magazine and senior editor for National Jeweler before becoming an independent writer in 1996. Her byline has appeared in The Condé Nast Traveler and Penthouse and many others. Gem Atlas is an online B2B networking platform for the gems and jewelry industry. We help you connect with businesses and professionals around the world. You can easily start generating new business leads through our platform. We are honored to have this discussion today. The topic for today is undertake, understanding the color stone market. There will be a question and answer button. So please feel free to enter your questions below and have them answered after the presentation. So now over to you, uh, Deborah and Liz. Good morning, good morning. Thank you, Jim Atlas team. Boy, I, I really love doing webinars with you. I particularly, I've said this before, I love the music in the beginning. It gets my <laughs> mojo going and I feel like we are uh, private detectives unearthing some amazing information, which I think we're going to, uh, here today, really, um, uh, I'm, a, I'm a fan of MVI and, and all their benchmark uh, uh, research. So I'm so excited to hear what you have to say, Liz. And I know you have a, a brief presentation and then we're gonna get, dig right into some questions. All right, thanks. Um, well, welcome everyone. Uh, and, and globally, so there are people, this is their morning or this is their late afternoon, welcome. Um, and thanks, Deborah, and thanks to Jem Atlas for pulling all this together. So Deb, Debbie's right. We um, actually at MDI, 50% uh, of our business is consumer and trade research. And it's been that way for the last 30 something years. We're one of the only uh, research companies that specializes in the gem jewelry and watch industry. I think because of that, um, we were commissioned by Fura, um, which is one of the largest gemstone mining companies in the world, to do a major research study last year. They really wanted to understand the, the global gem market and why um, we weren't selling more colored gemstone jewelry to consumers. That, that was basically the bottom line. Um, so what we did was we ran a, this research study with consumers, over a thousand consumers, and we did a hundred interviews or surveys with trade people um, in, in the U.S. We use that as our core country um, because the U.S. drives so much of the whole you know, world business. So I put together some, you know, I think, interesting uh, uh, takeaways from that research and then I'm going to tell you in the end where this all leads to. Um, so, and during my little presentation here, I'm going to do some polling. I'm going to ask you some questions. So feel free to, um, to give us some answers. You can just go right in and, and put in, you know, select what you think the correct answer is, and then we'll, we'll do, you know, talk about it. So as you see on my home slide here, basically what we're, uh, focused on is trying to understand the consumer gem, you know, gem jewelry uh, aspects of the business. So there's a lot, on, a lot on the trade side too, but primarily this is going to be about consumers, uh, which Deb loves to talk about, where the jewel is going to end up. That's what she always says, where is it going to end up? So 93% of consumers say that they love or like precious colored gemstones. That's a huge number. So we know, number one, we can click off that box. Do, are consumers even interested? Do they even like the product? 
The answer is resoundingly yes. All right. So 41, 44% say that they already own some type of precious um, jewelry, uh, ruby, emerald, and sapphire is what we're talking about. Um, and it could be uh, uh, just as accent stones, you know, and a piece of jewelry, but any, any kind of jewelry is what we ask them. What's interesting to all of us, of course, is the future. So 40% of younger consumers, so the 23 to 40 year olds, um, chose sapphire and then ruby and emerald as their three favorite stones. So that's great. I mean, we're interested in all gemstones, but those three, they're the, you know, the primaries or whatever you want to call them, um, the most, you know, uh, sought after stones and it shows up uh, in, in the research. So next, um, one, of, one of the designers that we interviewed um, had said to us, you know, I've always worked, you know, she, she does a lot of large pieces, as you can see from this ring. I've always worked with uh, colored gemstone engagement rings with a lot of color in them. And it used to be a one-off and not anymore. It's almost, she's told us, it's almost every uh, engagement ring she's working on. Um, people want, they definitely want color or they want to investigate color options. So it is really getting into one of the main parts of our business in fine jewelry, and that's the bridal market. That's why I put this in here because it is so important. So what we've been doing at MBI is researching it anyway over the last, you know, you know, 10, 11 years, but our research has shown that between 2015 and 2018, the amount of um, color that has gotten into the bridal market and, and really pushed by the consumer, not really pushed by the retailer, uh, has really gone up dramatically. So they're really, um, you know, quite interested in it. So here's your first polling question. Um, engagement rings are turning colorful. What percentage of U.S. shoppers, now these, uh, in our research, by the way, these are all jewelry consumers. Um, in, in 2019, do you think seriously looked at color in their engagement ring? What percentage? So you have a few seconds here, click off what you think um, is, is the correct number. Uh, and again, this is a you know, growing area. Um, and sometimes the color, by the way, is side stone. Sometimes it could be a center stone. Obviously, famous engagement rings like the one that Lady Di had that now, you know, Kate Middleton wears um, sort of propelled this into more acceptance. Um, but there have been other famous, you know, color engagement rings also. So it'd be interesting to see. Um, where we are. The options are 8%, 20%, 32%. So great, let's move on. So here's what everyone voted. And pretty good too, because it is 32%. So 48% of you guys thought it was 32, and it is. It's, you know, which is pretty high. It's very high from just I don't know, six, seven years ago. So it's important is the point here. So even in our research, what we found was ruby, emeralds, and sapphires were the main stones. Sapphire was number one for themselves. What would they um, suggest to, to relatives and friends? So, you know, it's all in that precious metal area. Excuse me, precious color gemstone area. So the next one we talked about in the research was, um, since sapphire came out so strong, of course, in bridal, we also wanted to delve into sapphire because sapphire, when you talk to consumers, sapphire is sort of um, primarily the stone, the first stone that they'll talk about. So we wanted to understand how much knowledge they really had about sapphires. So we showed them these actual stones here and we, uh, we gauged their, their opinion about them. So here's another polling question. Do you know what these stones are? 
we're going to give you some options. And we showed these to US consumers. Do you think they loved, you know, or liked them? What percentage? So your options, you have three tell the gemstone options, and then you have percentages for how many do you think you know consumers really loved or liked them? So you can answer these real quick and then we'll move on. I do have actually some of these stones here today. I just don't have a great camera to show you what they look like, but they, uh, they're quite, uh, quite pretty. All right, let's see where we are. Oh, here we go. Termally party, and they are party sapphires. And what percentage do we think loved or liked them? So the answer is 78%. And the reason this is so important isn't necessarily that it's because of the particular stone. It's that over and over in this research, we found out that the consumer is just fascinated by all sorts of color. It doesn't have to be blue is the point. And they're fascinated about other aspects too, which I'm gonna to touch on. So it's fun to, to talk about new stones. And it's interesting to see even the trade who, you know, haven't really gone out of their way to bring in these, these different types of stones have handled it. What we're finding out from the consumer, they have enormous interest in them. So that's something for us to know as an industry. Liz, may so, I interrupt Liz, you before you go sure. on I just, to, to uh, define a little bit more what Party Sapphire is while, while you're on the topic? Right, so I'm gonna talk about that. So here is a page that we, um, we put together after the research. Uh, uh, you know, we, we showed them lots of different Sapphire colors, not, not just blue because everybody sort of knows blue. So we showed them party and black and fancy colors. These all happen to be from Australia. They're all Australian sapphires. Um, and then we gauged, um, did they even know that sapphires came in different colors? And of course, you know, they don't except for a very small percentage. But once we showed it to them, you know, their interest level were high. Just for statistical basis, let me tell you, by the way, anything over 40% of like um, answers is really great because what you're saying is from an unknown product towards a comfort level and comfort level usually starts at 50 and above. So if you're already at 40, that means that, that the consumer doesn't need much to, to jump into that 60 and 70%. They really need the retailers, you know, to promote. I mean, they need to see the product to uh, promote it you know, in their own minds that this would be a good gift. This would be a good bridal engagement ring. So the, these are some more statistics that we, we put together after the research, including party, you know, black, um, and then of course the fancies. Um, so it, it's, it's been an interesting uh, way to open consumers' eyes but also to open the trades eyes that all these stones are out there and that variety, you remember that term, Deb, variety is the spice of life. So that's sort of what the consumer is, is looking for. So this happens to be from the Australian Government Association. These are all the colors that are mined in Australia. That center stone, by the way, is supposed to be black. So it goes from blue to black to teal to green into yellows. Um, it's, a, it's a gorgeous array. So it's just something different. I mean, that's, that's what the fashion industry does, right? Deb? They, they put out, you know, one year it's mini skirts, the next year it's ankle length skirts, you know? So they, they're always putting out something new to get consumers excited about it. And we in, in jewelry, even in fine jewelry, we should be doing the same thing. Let's get out, you know, new ideas, new looks. So anyway, we, this was all part of the research. 
and sapphire, um, sapphire, uh, ruby have the durability very close to diamond, so it's really a no-brainer, I think. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's a very strong. And consumers stone. recognize that, I think. I, I I think so too. Emeralds are a little softer, but there are lots of people who wear their emeralds every day. Maybe not in a ring, but certainly necklace, earrings, bracelets. Um, so, and rubies and sapphires are a very durable stone and make, you know, obviously gorgeous, you know, lifelong jewelry. So something else that we, these are all Erica Courtney designs, by the way. Something else we learned in the research, of course, which is so important these days, is that consumers are interested in where the product came from. You know, they want to know, they want to feel comfortable that when they're buying something that represents love, that other people weren't hurt giving that product to them. And this is a phenomenon that has just started taking off and worldwide. Um, no matter where you go in the world, people are interested in that. They're interested in the environment and they're in in interested in the welfare of the workers. You know, that's really important. So another polling question. What percentage of consumers are concerned with origin of the gems that they're buying? So you have some options here, 14, 31, and 42%. So what percentage really uh, in our research have said that? This doesn't always translate in the retail environment. I think Deb said this on a, on a uh, webinar not too long ago. The consumer doesn't necessarily come in and say, where's that from? But for that extra comfort level, if the retailer could say to them where this is from or that it is sustainably produced, responsibly produced, if it's um, you know, third party certified uh, to verify whatever claim the retailer is trying to, you know, is making at retail. It's important. So 42% won out here. And, whoops, sorry, went too long. It's 42%. So 42, that's a huge number. That, I mean, when we put that on a graph from our original research, we started with this maybe literally 20 years ago, it went from like three and 4%. It hovered under 5% for like five years. And then it started creeping up and now it's 42%. And that's the origin. They want to know where it comes from because consumers think, Deb, consumers think if the retailer knows, then the retailer is concerned too. If the retailer doesn't know or just, you know, talk, oh yeah, it's from Asia, you know, oh yeah, it's from South America and doesn't really know then they don't have the confidence. The consumer doesn't have the confidence either. And 50% really want to know how all the workers were treated to get the product to them. High numbers, very, very high. That's why I pulled this out of the research to share today, because these are very high numbers. And, and the numbers, Liz, aren't going to go down because Gen Z, which currently I believe is about 27% of uh, the consumer market now, uh, that's what they believe in. And it's only going to continue to grow. It's not going to diminish. Absolutely. Because yeah. as those people grow and spend more money, have higher income, they're going to be asking more questions. They're going to be demanding things. They may not say it right to a retailer's face, but they can walk out and go someplace else that they feel like that retailer really cares. That retailer really knows. They've gone out of their way to educate, you know? So you're absolutely right. This this isn't a, a trend where it's just going to disappear one day. It's not a fad, I should say. It's a total trend where it's just going to keep going up and up. And, and frankly, and, it should. Yes, and the companies have to be aggressive to say the story um, yeah. and not not shy away from it because that will be the way to attract uh, customers, especially the and young customers. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So the reason, you know, the origin is so important. Um, and as I said at the beginning, Fiora uh, um, funded and requested this research. Um, 
And then frankly, you know, they're, they're minors. They walk around with you know, hard hats on all day. So they totally left us alone and said, you do it. You're the experts. Go figure this out and come back to us. And um, so we, we looked into mining, you know, here are Fura's, you know, main areas of mining right now. So they have emeralds from Columbia, they have um, Australian sapphires, and then they have Mozambican rubies. Um, this, this is what they're mining, um, mainly mining today. It could be some other gemstones coming in the future. So it's, you know, pretty exciting stuff. But where did all this lead to? So what happened was we did all the research, we, we produced this huge report, we gave them a big, you know, virtual uh, boardroom presentation. They went away for a month and kind of hashed it over and they came back to us, Deb, and they said, what's the solution? There seems to be some disconnects. And this was in our presentation to them. There's definitely disconnects between the consumer's interest and acceptance and, and willing to, to buy with how much and how important colored gemstones have been uh, in retail stores. Now, this isn't just about the precious colored gemstones, it's all, all gemstones. So consumers feel like they don't see it enough. That's really the bottom line. They walk into jewelry stores and they see linear feet of white on white diamond which is fantastic, you know, white metal, white diamond. We love diamonds because often you sell them with colored gemstones. <laughs> um, but they don't see enough colored gemstones. And so we found out, by the way, that one of the issues was education because trade people, sales people in the store, there's a very organized way to self-educate on diamonds. And of course, there's usually a couple of diamond specialists um, in the store. Uh, but there normally isn't about color or maybe one or two salespeople in the store are, you know, love color. And so if somebody comes in and really wants color, they'll hand them over to that, that one or two, you know, people. Um, but really the consumer wants it all over. They want it in bridal. They want it in men's. They want it in kids. They want it. They want color. Um, and so when Fira came back to us a month later and said, what's the solution? You know, we had to think long and hard because we've been, you know, in this industry for a long time and what can we do? And so, we, you know, we said to them, look, I, we think we need to organize the whole trade. And this is a thing that they are very interested in. Um, and because of this disconnect that was so evident in the research, um, they said, create a solution and, and we will back it. So we did, we created the Fura Marketing Council and it's open to everyone in the trade who handles color from rough to retail. Um, and we're primarily, you know, particularly funding Ruby Emerald and Sapphire from Fura, but we're helping all gemstone business. You know how they say, you know, all boats rise. So that's what we're trying to do here. And and we just launched and we're gonna be at the JCK show. That's why I put in this image of anyone's going to the JCK or AGTA show, we're gonna be there. We actually have a panel discussion at AGTA with Tom Moses and an executive from Fiora talking about um, um, uh, 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 sapphires in particular because uh, GIA has taken on a big project to really analyze all these different colors of sapphires are coming out with reports and pages on this. So it's going to be really quite interesting coming up. So this is, this is where we are. We just pulled, I pulled out some, uh, I thought, interesting points that I really wanted to share with people about the research and why uh, the Fiora Marketing Council was developed. Um, Fiora is excited that, that people are you know, so interested in this, we have a website, you know, we're going to be at the show. It's a, it's a brand new council. We're looking for membership. We welcome everyone who works uh, with color. So there you go. Oh, wow. <laughs> There's so much to take in and so exciting. Um, but Liz, can you share a little bit more about who is behind Fiora and the organization itself? Um, because I, I, I think it's really, um, interesting the 
the, the, the lead part of the company, um, where they've come from, their experiences. Can you share a little bit about the company, Fura? Sure. I mean, we're not, we're not company spokespeople, um, but Fura is really headed up by a team of executives from the color gemstone industry who felt that, um, you know, they, ha they have some corporate, important corporate identities that they really make sure comes through with all their work. Um, in fact, if I just back this up a little, um, they have these three areas that they mine and when they uh, took over these mining operations, bought out the leases, et cetera, the first thing they did was come in with health and, health and safety um, protocols and, and lots of support for that, you know, the, you know, physically making sure that the workers were taken care of, making sure that, the, that their environment was very safe. Um, so it's all the things that we as a company, and I know as an industry, um, we really scrutinize these days. I mean, our company had the pleasure of working with the um, Rio Tinto, who owned the Argyle Diamond Mine, um, you know, from 1990. <laughs> um, so, and Rio Tinto was always on the forefront of, of health and safety and workers' rights and environment. Um, and, and it was just, it spoiled us. It was, you know, they're so organized in that manner. Um, and so we, we really, we knew what questions to ask when Fuhrer came to us about their philosophy. And they did, they did little things and they did really big things when they started, um, you know, taking over the, these deposits. I mean, little things like, um, you know, real helmets with real lights on them, to, you know, in, in uh, Colombia, it's a tunnel uh, situation. But when I talked to the senior executive who's in charge of there, he gave me one word I thought was so fascinating, Deb. I just thought, God, we just take this for granted. I said, what was the biggest change for the workforce? And he gave me one word, salary. They put their workers on salary. I said, well, how were they getting paid beforehand? That seems quite obvious, right? Wouldn't they all be making some kind of salary? He said, no, they would go into the tunnel. And if they came out with something of value, they, they'd get paid for it. They'd sell it right there. And if they didn't come out, they could be in there for hours, days, and not find something of value. So how do you, how do you support a family on that kind of hit and miss income? Well, you can't. So you can't, well, I should say. So uh, Fury came in and said, no, 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 we're not doing that. We're just gonna put everyone on salary and, um, and we're gonna produce. And boy, their production really went up because they're organized. You know, they've, they've taken them into the future, basically. Um, and, and something else they did, which I, I purposely put this image in on the right about, on the left, excuse me, these women working in the mines, because I personally was so uh, interested in the fact that they took away all gender-based job descriptions. So the women could have any income level that, that they were offering for any work being done. If a woman wanted to do anything, she could. There were no barriers. Um, so then women, especially women head of households, their income really went up. I mean, it's, it's little and big things like this that make such a difference. Um, then, of course, during COVID, this company really went out of their way to help as much as possible, including keeping yes. people on salary. It, as it should be. And that's, uh, yeah. that's yeah, the communities that pr provide these beautiful gems um, need to be taken care of. And that's going to become more important for consumers as we move forward undoubtedly so if you're not on that track now you better get on it absolutely that's right. yes that's right and, and can you talk a little bit more about uh the marketing council the benefits of of participating who can be a part of it um and and, and what the initial goal is 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 going to be in the rollout of all this so uh good question <laughs> Uh, two words that we go by. One is creativity and flexibility. 
And the reason we say that is we know how fractured the, the colored gemstone pipeline is. Um, even being at, at a prestigious show like AGTA and working with their, their members, you know, the, there, there are direct, mem you know, direct, you know, smaller members, bigger members, you know, there's all sorts of levels of companies that do all sorts of different things. Um, and some of them with, a, with some support, you know, through advertising or through um, just creating assets, advertising and marketing assets, education, um, which we're, um, I'm going to tell you about in a minute, um, and just other types of support. So it's actually talking to every member and saying, what are you doing well and how can we make it better? Or where do you feel like you need the most help? And then we customize the membership per company. Um, so it's, it's really, you know, quite fascinating. We're just, just, you know, talking to members now and it, it's, it could be, you know, everything or very little, it just depends what's, what's best for that member. So the membership is really rough, rough stone dealers, you know, cut and polishers, uh, polish dealers, jewelry manufacturers, jewelry designers, and retailers. I mean, we're all, this whole system is about getting more product into retail stores and sold out the door because we know the consumer wants it. See, this is the beauty. And not only do we know they want it, the retailer makes more money. They make more profit. The whole pipeline is more profitable on colored gemstones. Everyone tells us, all, this came through in the research, uh, than diamonds. And only because diamonds have lost some of their profitability lately um, over the last few years. But anyway, every, I mean, it's a win-win, right? So that's what we're focusing on is flexibility and creativity. Will there be a national campaign like in general for these three gems? Is that on the horizon? I don't see that on the horizon because we really want to work through our members and, and it's not, you know, again, it's not only about Ruby Emeralds and Sapphires, of course, right. that's the main thing. Um, we are partnering with some major retailers to, um, you know, like perhaps a major retailer in Australia to really uh, emphasize the seven different colors of Australian Sapphires that could come to the US too. So through retailers, we could help support um, product related, um, you know, new market development. Right. Okay. One thing, too, were there any surprises to you in the research, like real standouts that made you think, hmm? <laughs> <laughs> You know, the biggest thing is the disconnect, like, can, yeah. you know, you know, the bottom line is the, the pipeline, the supply chain thinks retailers don't know how to sell color gemstones. That's the right. problem. And the retailers think no one supports me to sell color gemstones. Unlike the diamond industry where I get co-op advertising and I get, uh, you know, trunk shows and I get all sorts of stuff. Nobody really does that with color. A right. few companies do, but not, not generally. So there's sort of this disconnect where they're kind of blaming each other. And that came across in almost every interview we did. Okay, all right, that's, that's legitimate because there's been no De Beers for color gemstones, right? right? There hasn't been an organization that kind of made a product into a straight linear tube and this is how the, the supply chain is going to go that hasn't happened with color and again there's little artisanal miners all the way through you know big miners like a fura um so what we want to do is we want to smooth out that disconnect so that i thought was really prominent in in the research is the sort of what everybody thinks the problem is, it's the other guy. Right. 
And what, what I think though is so strong uh, in the research is the consumer power. It's, it's, it's being pushed from the consumers up. And whenever we products, you could say the same thing about lab grown diamonds too, are being pushed from the consumers up. There's, you, you must respond eventually. And I think that gives strength to the, the trend itself and the product category. Yeah, I, I do too. I mean, to have consumers, I mean, consumers do come in asking for colors. Retailers told us that all the time. Right. And a few retailers say, only two actual retailers said, I've never missed, or I never lost, excuse me, I never lost a color stone sale because I have a big selection. Right. But on retailers who don't have big selections, um, or have limited selections. You know, there are retailers that only carry, you know, like birthstones during the birthstone month, you right. know, and then they only keep maybe one or two little pieces of jewelry year round um, of that birthstone. Um, those, those retailers usually say we convert them to diamond sales or uh, they get an all, all metal piece or, or they, they leave, you know, we don't have the selection. So they, so, so they sell what they're comfortable with. <laughs> well, they, they stop what they think they're stop comfortable with. what they're comfortable with, with. Yes. yes. So part of our program, by the way, which we're going to introduce at the JCK show and the AGTA show, is we're putting together a series of five educational videos. Short, cute, animated, you know, very current, you know, style of videos. And one is about the overall market, one's about sales technique, and then one's about ruby, emerald, and sapphires. And we'll add other gemstones maybe later. Um, so these are for everyone in the trade, really. They're for, you know, obviously retail sales staff, of which there are thousands that we want to get to, so they feel comfortable about what it is they're selling. We want them to self-educate. Um, we want them to feel like, uh, you know, I'm not afraid of color. I can sell color. I can romance a stone. I know enough. You know, one of the one of the gentlemen we interviewed, which by the way is is mentioned in in, in the video, as uh, a as a a great a great retailer, and he said, you know, when I I wasn't into color, and then when I started carrying color. I thought, oh, I'm going to be asked technical questions about color and I'm not going to know the answer. And he said, if I could tell every other retail salesperson out there, don't be afraid of those type of questions because they never come. They are so rare that, you know, you, you, you shouldn't, that isn't the fear. <laughs> the fear should be you don't have the inventory. The fear isn't what the consumer is going to ask you. But this training information is really to get salespeople com more comfortable with color. Um, we also have a flip book, you know, that they can have in their hand and, you know, on their counter. And when they're not busy, they could be flipping through and, and getting more highlights of how to sell color. Um, and we have a link to GIA. You know, GIA has a fantastic course called Color Essentials. They have diamond essentials. They have all this you know, series called Essentials. Very inexpensive. We actually have a discount code um, for that course. I mean, and it's a fun course, all video based, you know. It's a fun course. It really opens your eyes. You know, you really see a lot of interesting thing there. Some of it's technical, some of it's about the beauty of the stone and the origin. I mean, you know how GIA is. They, you know, this is, this is their specialty. So we want people, we want salespeople to get more comfortable with color and we want retailers to stock more color. Yes, so true, so true. Um, I, I, I don't know, I want to dive into just a couple of questions that came our way, if that's okay. Sure. While we're on this, uh, one question was if, if Liz, you could share the statistics on your first slide again. Okay. Let's see if I can go back here. Here we go. Okay. So 93% love or like. Now these are jewelry consumers in the US, not just random. 44% uh, 
own some type of sapphire ruby and emerald jewelry. 40% of younger consumers, so that's 23 to 40 year olds, chose sapphires their favorite, but it was very closely followed by ruby and emerald. Now, that's not all that surprising about which colors they selected. What I thought was surprising is that 40% of this younger demographic is still engaged with ruby, emerald, and sapphires. You know, um, when I was talking to Erica Courtney, the designer, she was saying, you know, for a while there, younger people weren't interested. They wanted more exotic stones. They weren't really interested in ruby, emeralds, and sapphires. Um, but now she tells me uh, lately, because there's more colors of sapphires available, um, they are very interested in ruby, emeralds, and sapphires. So, you know, that's, you know, that age demographic is our future, right? So. I, I think sometimes the industry stands in its own way in terms of what they think is the perfect colored stone. And we've come to find that consumers love maybe pastels or light shades or, uh, you know, a, a sapphire that might have a little yellow in the blue and all of these things. It's because it, the color is the emotional connection. It's not so much perfection as I think in, in diamonds we seek to, to get so much. It's what, it, what moves me. That's right. That's right. When you talk to a good salesperson, they'll say, this stone spoke to the customer. And that's how, how you know, we would all shop. You know, you, you, you're looking at something of real beauty and you go, that's me. I really like that. You know, I really love that. It speaks to you. And gemstones can do that like nothing else because they are unique. Yes. There, you know, you can have, and you should have unique stones in your stores. And you should, even just in sapphire blues, you should have light blues, medium blue, dark blues, and mix them up in the same piece of jewelry to look for that from your vendors, ask for that from your jewelry vendors. So yeah, yes. that, that's really an important thing. You know, let me just go one more. Did I, did I miss this slide? Because this is the slide I was just talking about about the margins, you know, when we ask retailers and, um, uh, you know, and, and suppliers. So retailers, you know, are talking about such a you know, much higher margin with color than with diamonds. So maybe I missed this earlier, sorry. I was just probably so excited to be talking to you, Deb, and, and to <laughs> all of our viewers. I'm talking to you, Liz. I do too. We've got some really great questions. So if it's okay with you, I'm I'm gonna uh, yeah, let's get through them right into I them. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, one question that came in earlier is how about pink sapphires? So yeah, pink sapphires are beautiful. They don't uh, normally come from Australia, but all sapphires, all color, all color. So pink is not part of what's coming from from Australia. Pardon? Pink is not, pink sapphires are not coming from Australia. No, not that I know of, okay. but that's okay. I mean, yeah, yeah. color is, you know, color. Absolutely. Um, and then let's see, what's your take on the retail market pricing per carat for sapphire, ruby, and emerald? Like uh, example, Rappaport for diamonds, talking about you know, at pricing, price charts, price guides? I think it's probably, first of all, that would be very complicated. Um, and GIA with a uh, pure really, we, we kind of instigated this. Um, and GIA is working on a way to sort of categorize colorization, you know, the colors of the different gemstones. I don't want to say too much about it because I don't want to get it wrong. Um, but I think a price chart at this point would be probably really difficult. But as the, the whole supply chain gets more organized and more um, congruent between all the different levels, I think it could be something for the future. 
kind of leads to another question here is what are your thoughts on uh, provenance of gemstones in blockchain being introduced? Yeah, I think all types of tracking is really important. Um, it's harder to do with small size stones, but, um, but not impossible. Um, so yes, I'm, I'm all in favor. You know, I, I think what the industry has to understand, and this is true with all industries, is that when you make a claim at retail, you need a third party verification system to back up that claim. And you know, some really great companies have said, well, we go to the source and we know the cutters and we do all that. So we're confident in what is showing up in the, in the, in the stores. And, and this is true for, you know, ready to wear and shoes and all that. And that's great. And they're in the forefront of what everybody should be doing. But on top of that, you still need a layer of an independent third party verification system. And that's kind of what a blockchain system could be for tracking. So I'm, I'm all in favor of that because all consumer products are going this way. All consumer products. So, um, so I think it's really important. Um, and there are some companies that have, that are really, you know, gotten very involved in the jewelry industry, like SCS Global uh, out of San Francisco. They do, I don't know, like 14,000 products. But if they can, if they can look at a piece of lumber and tell you the mountain it, that tree was cut down on in Oregon, and, and now it's in a Home Depot, and they can tell you where it came from. I mean, that's amazing. And if they can do that, you know, they can they can do diamonds and colored gemstones. Absolutely. Is there a statistic for the difference in market demand for untreated gemstones compared to treated ones for everyone for sapphires? Good question. Very good question. We did not ask that question. Mm. Um, not that we wanted to or didn't want to. Um, it's just that it was, it was, you know, um, it's a bit more technical uh, necessarily because uh, to get to that type of, of answer. Um, but in subsequent re uh, research, we plan on doing it. We just want to make sure that we're presenting it in the right way, in a you know, very neutral way. Um, but, but there's so much heating of gemstones. And heating, as you know, is a permanent you know, process that stones can go through. And it just takes what's already in the stone and like releases it to make the stone maybe less cloudy or intensify the color. Um, so it's sort of like bringing a very natural stone just one step further through a natural process of heating. If it was still in the ground low towards the center of the earth, it would have probably had this heat, heating done, and some do. Um, so, so we didn't ask it in the research, and very, very few retailers brought it up or trade people brought it up. Other types of treatments, yeah, they're looking more concerned about that for sure, but not, not heating. How do you see the future of gemstones with current topics like rising environmental pressure, sustainability, and consumer awareness about responsible sourcing and traceability, which you, you touched on in, in the presentation, but can go a little further for us? You know, I, I'm so glad someone asked this question because, you know, we get a little, um, you know, we, we've seen these pictures of these, um, you know, in third world, these people in mud pits trying to eke out, you know, with their, their little um, trays, trying to eke out a few stones. I mean, that type of often illegal, you know, mining um, it is, is just, just such, such a poor situation that you, I think mining overall has gotten lumped in together. Um, but the reality is, and I, and again, because of my, you know, 25 year of exposure to the Argyle mine, 
in a very remote part of Australia. Um, it mine, you know, it was it was sort of discovered in '85. They were really up and running by '87. Um, they were, you know, brought off on a '90 because they had so many champagne diamonds coming out of the Argyle deposit. Um, there was nothing there beforehand. Um, no income driving, you know, situation for the local people. Um, really barren, right? And um, so they came in, they built an apparatus to, to mine. It was an open pit, and then they went underground. Uh, they would fly workers in two weeks on, two weeks off. They had a lot of local workers, you know, native local workers come in. Um, and everybody, you know, was health and safety. Everybody made money when there was no income before. So, and now they've closed, you know, they're exhausted the situation and now they're working with the locals about how to utilize what's left there. What do they want to keep? You know, what can be um, refurbished? You know, what can be replanted? All of that is going on right now. It's like a three-year process. Um, but those people who came and their elders, by the way, came and blessed the site, you know, and we're so grateful for this. And, and these, these, if it's done right, mining can be a real revenue, you know, sustainable source of a healthy environment, better schooling, better healthcare, um, you know, not worrying about where your next meal is going to come from. Um, you know, and a company like Fuhr, and of course there's others um, who do the right thing and put the workers in the forefront of what their goals are making sure workers are being taken care of as they go. Um, so I'm, I'm not anti-mining. I am pro-mining when it's done right. Mm -hmm. So, and I've been to lots of areas of the world mining, you know, where we worked uh, with the Peruvian government and they, you know, mine a lot of silver and gold there and some stones. And, you know, we've worked all over the world with mining companies and some of them are fantastic. And the people would have had nothing else if, if mm -hmm. it wasn't for whatever that natural resource and it's their natural resource. So when they're benefiting, that's the way it should be. So there was kind of leading into uh, 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 a bit of a longer statement from one of our attendees, but asking about how does Fura work with artisanal miners, not just those who are part of their organization, but in so many cases, you see big mining companies come in and it puts it, it, it puts out the artisanal miners who aren't working for the company. What's that relationship like for Fura with the artisanal miners? So again, I'm not a spokesman for Fura, but from what I know, um, in different areas, they definitely work with locals. First of all, they try to take those locals and train them and put them to work <laughs> and give them salaries. Um, but second of all, there are some interesting ways that things happen. So in Australia, for example, they have what they call tourism mining, you know, um, where literally like a camping outing with your family, you drive out to these remote areas and you camp or you stay in these little motels and, and you go out and mine, you know, dig up gemstones. So that's all run by local people. You know, and, and it's a lot of fun to bring kids out and get them involved. And so Fiora looked at that and said, God, what a great opportunity to build even more interest in color gemstones. So they're like helping, they're like giving more space to these type of, of companies and making, you know, just and coming in and doing lectures for the tourists and giving them, you know, all sorts of little support to get, especially to get these kids excited about color gemstones. So is that a cute idea? I mean, I never heard of this before. I just think it's fabulous. And yeah. by the way, my dad was a lapidarius. I can remember being a little kid going to an opal mine in Idaho. He used to own part of an opal mine in Idaho and wearing an apron and walking around with a spray bottle and spraying the dirt. And if I saw something flash, I'd pick it up and I'd put it in my apron. And that could be an opal. Right. You know, so the child labor right there at, you know, four, seven, 10 years old. Uh, 
uh, that was a camping trip for us. And right. so when I heard this in Australia, I just thought, oh my God, this my dad would have loved this idea. Yeah, so, that's yeah, so I think fear goes out of their way to take all those people who are trying to earn a living, bringing them into the into the company, training them, giving them, you know, the support, the health and safety, um, you know, uh, uh, tools that they need, um, and giving them a salary. Yes. Yeah. Fantastic. It's such a wonderful story, really. There's, there are so many wonderful stories to be told from this, and that's part of of the sales of color too is sharing these stories. I think that's right. That's right. But you know, we're again, Fuhrer can speak for themselves, and I welcome everyone to go to um, you know the Fuhrer website um, and learn more about them, and to come to our website you know, uh, and learn more about us, which is fmcgems.com. So FMC is for your marketing council and, and see how we can help, you know, um, businesses all over the world. Although right now we're concentrating on the U S India and Australia, but, um, but we're, you know, just in the forefront now, obviously we just kind of launched um, so we'll, we'll talk to everyone. We want everyone to give consumers what they want, which is more color gemstone choice in their jewelry. That's wonderful. Well, also too, is this webinar going to be posted uh, for everyone to see later so they can relive every moment again? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, Deb, I certainly appreciate you uh, getting up very early and doing this with me. Oh, I enjoy it so much. And, and I love working with, uh, with Gem Atlas on these presentations. It's so much fun. But what's really great is the interesting uh, research and information that has come out of this project that everybody can benefit from in the industry. And that's exciting. And, so. and the, re the actual research report is on our website. So you can see the whole report on, on the MVI website. No, it's on the Fuhrer oh, website. It's on the, on the web. FMC website. FMC, FMC right. <clears throat> yeah. Fantastic. I know we're toward the end here. There's a couple of more questions. I don't know if you want, should we wing it? Quickly. I'd okay. Love to. Okay. Um, someone is asking if you have an idea of the percentage of American consumers who are jewelry consumers. You know, this is very, I've been asked this question many times over the years, and the answer is all of them. And I'll tell you why, <clears throat> pardon me, jewelry is one of those, fine jewelry is one of those um, products that is in 90% of households. Um, the other 10% had jewelry and don't have jewelry today, fine jewelry today, 90%. So it's, it's uh, an inclusive product. You know, self-adornment is 180 million years old. The earliest yes. mummies that we have found or the earliest frozen uh, people we have found have things hanging on them that have no tool. They're not a tool, they're self-adornment. So this is inherent in human beings to self-adorn. And then the gift giving on top of that and something that'll generally lasts forever, which is fine jewelry. Um, it's just part of our, our every, almost every culture. And, yeah. um, you know, is, is sort of a very human thing to do. Yes, yes. Which is why next time we do this, I would like to wear some emeralds and rubies <laughs> for, my neck and for my ears so that people can see it. Um, so let's plan that for next time. Let's plan that. <laughs> Okay, I think we've you pretty much answered. Oh, one more, one more quickie. Okay, one more. Okay. Um, how do we create awareness from the ground level of consumers as individual retailers regarding quality and pricing of gemstones? Like you said, there is no one authority as it is the case with diamonds and therefore it is much more difficult. It's a challenge for sure. Please, please talk to us about it too. I mean, I think that the, um, the thing about gemstones obviously is that normally, you know, you don't sell the loose gemstone, it's in jewelry. 
or you have a loose stone options, you're gonna mount it in jewelry. So there's a lot of different aspects to pricing that can happen. Um, but I think sourcing and, and I think, I mean, if I had a retail operation right now, I'd be looking at uh, uh, all of my supply chain operators and seeing what is sourcing, what their sourcing ability is and their third party certification could, could be, may not be in line today, but certainly talking to them about, well, within the next 12 months, we really want this and this and this uh, third party certified. Um, so I think um, the, the idea of color, <clears throat> excuse me, and pricing is going to be, it's one way today, I think, you know, over the next year and then two years, it's going to be a little bit more, uh, first of all, we're going to be selling more gemstones. So that, that's going to be good. And then I think it'll level off a little bit if there's some, you know, particular variations in pricing. But it's going to be exciting. I'm so this is like, I don't know. I know. I, 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 I've done some really great things in my career and in our company, and this is certainly one of them. We are so excited to be helping, you know, literally every retailer, or every stone dealer, everyone who wants to be involved in uh, color gemstones. So it's fun. It is exciting. And I've been writing about colored gemstones for 30 years, starting with colored stone and while so many things have changed, so many things have not. And the, and the yeah. fragmentation of the industry, particularly with, with marketing, um, has always been an issue. So yeah. um, it's, it's a new frontier and it's exciting. Okay. And, yeah. So thank, thank you, you again, so Deb. This has been great. Yay! And everybody, you know, watch the video if you haven't seen it yet, if you, you know, couldn't stay on this. Hey, Nicole. Hi, uh, thank you so much for, you know, sharing your, in that your valuable time and your expertise. And I think it was such an informative session and it was lovely. And we'd also like to thank the audience for such an active participation. And we really hope that you enjoyed the session and can use this knowledge to the best of your advantage in your respective fields of business. Uh, we'd like to thank Debbie and Liz once again. And of course, if anybody has any further questions, they can email it at info at the rate gematvis.com. And we will forward the same to Liz and Debbie. So thank you so much and have a good day. Bye.